My real, real plea is for the, the entire court system to start thinking seriously that technology is not our enemy, it's our friend. Um, you can get a lot accomplished by the computer. Yes, ever so often the system goes down. Yes, there's nothing, there's nothing that that can 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 bring tears to to to, 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 to my eyes. But I have forgotten to save the last five pages of the document, and for some reason I did not realize that that prop that came up was asking me about the save, and I hit no. The last five pages. It it continues to happen. But the fact is that the technology is here to stay, and we need to use it. And we are not going to get rid of the backlog in the case in the course which we have, either the civil backlog or the criminal backlog, unless we understand that the technology is here to help us, and that that we shouldn't have, we certainly should not leave magistrates having to sit on a pre-sentence report when they can simply go into the computer and um, find whether the person before them has priors. With that. I can only say to you that um, some of these, I have, I have thrown out some ideas and I have made some proposals, but it is part of my approach to tell you that I don't have all the answers. And so, and so I, throw, I tend to throw out questions with the hope that it will prompt discussion among you, um, with the hope that if you have an idea, that you can email me at the court and tell me what your idea is. <laughs> and I will turn on my email and read it. <laughs> Chief Justice at lawcourts.gov.bb Chief Justice at lawcourts.gov.bb I give you that email address because because that is the email address which is accessible by my secretary and by my admin officer. Um, the other one which I have is M. Gibson at lawcourts.gov.bb, only I can access. But the Chief Justice at Law Courts, anyone can access. And yes, if you have ideas, um, please, please let me. We have um, a digital recording system called for the record, STR. And in fact, it is operational in Supreme Court. Although, to my disappointment, I'm told that it's only, I discovered that it's only operational in two courts, and that even in Supreme Court, judges are taking evidence in long hand. Thankfully, not in criminal cases. In criminal cases, uh, they've got uh, court reporters, but in civil cases, they still take evidence in long hand. Now, I made some tentative exploration as to whether to speed up the delivery of decisions in criminal cases in the master's court, whether we can have SDR installed in the master's court. Our problem is that our plant is aging. The buildings that we go into to hear <coughs> magistrate, to, to hear criminal cases before magistrate those buildings are aging. And I was told that, in fact, there are only two buildings that the, that magistrates and and the, the registry staff could think of where we could actually install FDR immediately. And that's in District A and in, in Oyster. And I was told that the, the other courts require, are required to be retrofitted to so to install FDR, because one of the problems with FDR is you, you need a proper power supply and you need to make sure that that the equipment is going to be running. The masters complain that they have no technology by which they can do a search of whether an accused person before them had another case in another magistrate's court. One of the magistrates also present and also remaining um, uh, anonymous, told the story of having sat in a district 
in which he heard a case against against him and an offender. And he he convicted an offender for finding that there there was enough evidence to find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But somehow the offender's name jumped his memory. He felt, you know, I think I've seen this person in another court. And the magistrate left his court, his court and drew up another district and looked at the books and records to discover that his children, in fact, he had seen that offender in another court and he had convicted him in that other court. But there's no technology by which the magistrates can do a search for prior conviction. Now, the reason why why this is troubling is because if if a magistrate is not minded to search to see whether or not a person has a, has priors, and he can't and he can't see they have priors in other districts, you run the risk of giving the person a lesser sentence than they really deserve. And part of the reason why why this is, is of concern to me is that the magistrate of the magistrates also mentioned to me that if if a person has been the subject of a domestic violence order and domestic violence is treated sort of as a civil matter, it's not a criminal matter, you're not gonna see that name come up at all when you when you, you go to the other books and records to do your search. The reason why why this is of concern to me is because in New York there's a statewide domestic violence registry. I mean statewide. So if sitting in that and every case that is, every matrimonial case gets a search of the domestic violence registry. So that if you're sitting in Nassau County and you put a person's name in there, and that person had a domestic violence matter in Onondaga County, which is like 160 miles away from Nassau, it will come up. You will see it. And we need that technology for our magistrates and for our courts. We, it is absolutely crucial that we have the technology which allows magistrates to do that kind of search. And in, a, in an era where we tweet and email, our magistrates should not be bubbled by this lack of technology. Can my staff or the staff of any other judge disseminate or talk to someone else and tell them what the judge is thinking? Yes, they can. Can they go on Facebook or email and say, you know, I think that the judge is going against 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 your your plan on this one. Um, you're you're probably going to lose this appeal. Can they do that? Yes, they can. So the social networks pose a problem which do not admit of which does not admit of easy solution because more often than not, by the time the tweet or the posting on someone's wall or the email attachment is discovered, it has already been published to several persons and the damage, so damage can be done, has already been done. But I am not saying that to suggest that the social networking systems do not play an important role. Because one of the things that you will hear coming from quite a few persons who, who are reluctant to use technology is that they will tell you all of the ills that you can suffer from technology. And every time they tell me that, my response to them is, well, I bet you didn't think that when Orville and Wilbur Wright invented airplanes, that they were also inventing airline crashes. But they were. And when Henry Ford made the Model T available at a cheap price to most families, he was involved, he was inventing the possibility of fatal accident by motor car. When was the last time that you refused to get in your car and drive it because there was a fatal accident in another parish? So there's no reason why we shouldn't utilize the technology and in fact we need to use the technology 
to get a lot of the cases which are pending in our courts, out of the courts. There were a lot of young people who had gotten involved in the sale of drugs, of drugs, the use of drugs. And that putting them in prison had the result of making them into hardened criminals. In other words, they were, they were graduating with degrees and not from UE. They were actually becoming more hardened criminals because they were being sent to judge and not to a drug treatment center. In addition, there are there are quite a few persons who've been convicted, and these are spelled out by Sir David in his address uh, in May of 2008. There are quite a few people who ended up needing treatment in or at the psychiatric hospital. So one of the one of the challenges which we have is and I don't know if the public is going to be as sympathetic to this as we would wish. But one of the challenges which we have is the question of whether we want to establish a drug treatment court with a view to ensuring that, well not ensuring, but at least attempting to save some of the younger offenders from being indoctrinated and inculcated by the older offenders whom they will meet at Dodds if they go for if they are sent up for a drug offense. And it is my my submission that we should have that drug treatment court. It is in fact the way in which modern courts are moving. Um, the drug treatment court in Nassau County it's, it's recent. This, this, um, this is all recent thinking. But the, the drug treatment court in Nassau County is about four or five years old. I mean, it was established since I was in Nassau County, and I, I, I went to Nassau County Supreme Court 14 years ago. And it has worked. It has worked. There are a lot of people um, who graduated from it. And I've not seen it in operation, but I know it the judges who operated and they've got a whole program where at the end of at, at the end of uh, the program people actually graduate and get certificates and and they and they the attempt to find jobs for them. Um, and the whole idea is that if you can keep them off track from criminality, you can you can get them back into society. So the idea is that they're actually reachable and teachable, or at least we ought to make the attempt to see if we can identify those who are reachable and teachable. And and or we have the option that I can be I can be Mark Morrison, the unmerciful, <laughs> and see them as hardened criminals in in training and therefore um, just find the nearest valve in which I could throw away the key so that you never get out. But I don't believe that that approach makes sense. In March of this year, the master of the rules of the English Court of Appeal, who is the essentially the head of the English Court of Appeal, Lord Newberger, suggested that communication between the English court and the lawyers could be achieved by using social networking systems. And he recommended that tweeting should be used in court, although he added wisely, not from the bench. <laughs> and I used to, I myself used to encourage attorneys when they had to submit post-trial submissions to me, to get them to me either on a disk, or better yet, as an attachment to an email, so as to avoid using paper. But and I'm sure you knew that there was going to be a caveat here. Caveats need to be entered. The social networks are based on the idea of friends. And the question which I which, uh, I have for criminal judges is, does a judge compromise her appearance of, of impartiality when she gets convicted, when she gets 
fantastic, not perfect, fantastic, by a Facebook or Blackberry Messenger friend whose cousin is appearing in front of her charged with a criminal offense. In a small society such as ours, how much can we really avoid this? Especially when the same kind of contact can be made in the supermarket. So even if even if judges are supposed to be seen and not heard, we can't live by law alone. Not by bread alone, we still got to go to the supermarket and buy meat and lard oil and those things. So contact can, contact can be made. The second example I'm going to give is an actual event that arose out of a trial which took place in the Bahamas and led to a discussion concerning the jury system. I'm certain that several of you in this audience know the case to which I'm going to refer to, so I'm not going to use any names. I will simply say that the case involved a famous person whose death resulted in a trial. The ju jury was deliberated for a while when presently the foreman sent to the trial judge to announce that they had reached a verdict, which ultimately was a verdict of acquittal. But before the verdict could be announced, a juror had taken a cell phone and texted someone to tell them what the verdict was. So that by the time the verdict was publicly announced, it was already stale news because the word had already been texted to many others many, many times. That to me is, is a development which causes concern. And the question I ask is, well, how, how can we avoid this? When we discussed this case recently at the Edge of Judiciary meeting, which had taken place in the Bahamas as part of the conference of the Caribbean Association of Judicial Officers, I made what I thought was a bold suggestion. I said that, just as occurs um, in Supreme Court in New York, all cell phones should be taken at the door of the court, and the owner should be given a numbered receipt which permits them to retrieve the cell phone on their way out. That is still a possibility, still something that I want to consider because I have had the the annoyance of hearing cell phones ringing in the court of appeal during or the recent meeting which I had with the superintendent of prisons. He pointed to statistics which indicated that there was an increase in the percentage of younger prisoners. He informed me to my surprise that there were young prisoners who were committing offenses just so they could get into prison with the sole purpose of exacting revenge against someone who happened to be in prison. My submission is that nothing that the courts can do in terms of increasing sentences will solve that problem. We cannot threaten to increase the sentence of someone whose express purpose in getting sentenced to prison in the first place was to deal his version of payback. Indeed, the longer the time he has in prison, the better for him because he will think that it's the longest time he has to exact revenge. 